Okay, welcome everyone to the launch event of the Singularity University Chapter Zurich. We are pleased to have you all connected from each and every corner of the world. Thanks for that. My name is Alessandro Melli. I am the Chapter Ambassador and a Mobility Specialist. We kindly ask you to switch off the microphone and bear with us till the end as we have just for you an incredible speaker stage. Before getting started, Let's get uh, introduced that let me introduce you to Biagio Gentile. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, thanks Alessandro for uh, the introduction. Uh, I'm Biagio Gentile, I'm a managing director in the, in the service industry. I'm a technology enthusiast and a, a real resilient game changer. I'm very happy to be here today with, you, with all of you. I'm proud of our team. Thanks, Alessandro. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Diego. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the uh, special guests and uh, speakers from all over the world. I, I believe that uh, you will really love the webinar tonight. Tonight, but uh, don't let's hesitate. Just let me introduce again to the to the next co-ambassador uh, to Diego Sperduti. Diego? Hello there, sorry, muted. Um, thanks to Biagio, thanks to Alessandro. Um, hello, this is uh, Diego Sperduti. I'm a sales executive in the energy industry, um, blockchain addicted, and in general enthusiast about uh, every technology. Um, it wasn't, of course, not supposed to run this event online, but uh, we'd rather prepare to have it face-to-face, uh, -face, which have been lovely but um, the very well-known circumstances uh, led us to run it online and uh, we find it lovely because we exploit the big impact of digital transformation. Um, but by the way, go to the, go to the point, uh, let me introduce our very knowledgeable Andrea Stimak, which is not only our co-ambassador and part of our leadership team, but also the, the moderator of today's event. I hand it over to you, Andrea. Hello everyone, good evening to our European participants and good morning to the ones overseas. I'm thrilled to be part of this uh, leadership team and uh, alongside Alessandro Biagio and Diego. And my name is Andrea Stimak, I'm marketing strategist, business creativity and change advisor. I really wish you a warm welcome to the launch event of Singularity Zurich chapter. So, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, first, Alessandro will tell you more about our Zurich chapter. So, Alessandro, the mark is yours. Thanks for that, Andrea. Um, so, uh, something about singularity is something about this chapter. Uh, if you don't know a lot about singularity, Singularity University is a place that te teaches about exponential growing technologies and helps to prepare leaders to build, uh, to build an abundant future. Our mission, the mission and the purpose of our chapter is connecting with you all, engaging meaningful conversation about these exponential technologies and uh, tackle the world grand challenges, hopefully together. So thank you, Alessandro. Uh, I'm and we are honored and delighted to have five Yes, you heard well, five special guests from Singularity University from Singular Valley and two guest speakers from very well reputed companies. Now we will start with Pascal Finet and Jeffrey Rogers sharing our virtual stage. So first, let me introduce you Pascal Finet. Pascal is co-founder and fund to rival at Be Radical. He's Singularity University Chair for Entrepreneurship and Open Innovation. And he's also venture partner at Bold Capital. His work focuses on intersection of technology, global impact, and culture, inspiring and empowering entrepreneurs, corporate irritants, and change makers to tackle the most intractable problems of our time. And also, I would like to introduce you Jeffrey Rogers. Jeffrey just jumped on a board with Pascal at B Radical Group, his educator and conversation host. Since 2017, he has been a top moderator 
of SU Executive Program and International Summit. Jeffrey connects dots, ideas, and people for Fortune 500, for, for, sorry, for Fortune 500 companies. He has spent decade building learning and development solutions, consulting digital learning startups, and delivering immersive leadership programs in San Francisco Bay. And now, let's welcome Pascal and Jeffrey at the stage. Guys, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much. And I'll uh, toss it over to Jeffrey, who will uh, kick us off uh, in, this, uh, in this crazy journey. Thanks, Pascal. And thank you, Andrea. And thank you, friends, so much for the warm welcome. I get to be the first one to hop on and speak, not from a very lovely digital background representing your new chapter. Congratulations on that, by the way, but instead from my living room in San Francisco, California. And I think at this moment, it's particularly important and also particularly inspiring to be able to bring groups like this one together. So thank you very much for having me and let's get right into it. Um, Pascal and I are gonna start with a warm, cheery slide like the one that you can hopefully see here, giving you a nice hello before we jump into where you all know we have to go, which is to acknowledge the context of this moment. And that is uh, basically this. Um, as you're all very keenly aware, sometime in the last few months, humanity has kind of taken a collective mighty step off a little bit of a cliff and we are descending. Uh, down into a pit of sorts and without even touching on the untold uh, human misery just to touch the economic here I can say from the US context that we're looking at something like 26 million jobs lost in the last four weeks and we're still on our way down and we don't know exactly what the bottom looks like and that's probably the same for quite a few of you but we know that a bottom does exist and we know that there is going to be a beyond, there is going to be an after COVID. And I think right now, as you all are kicking off your chapter and thinking about what you're gonna be able to do together and what we can do together, we need to be thinking about what, what happens next, where we are going to go. We know by early April that there are something like 50 potential vaccine candidates and 100 potential treatment drugs already in development, according to the Milken Institute and uh, hundreds of clinical trials launched and already registered around the world with the WHO. So we strongly believe that we will get through this. And I like to think instead of just regarding this as an endless descent into a pit that perhaps we're on a journey of another kind. And I'm going to take a cue from the novelist Arundhati Roy, who I think has done a masterful job of reconceptualizing this moment as not just falling into a pit, but perhaps actually traversing through a portal that we are leaving one old world and on our way into a new one. And so it would behoove us to think about what we wanna find when we get there, because that world is going to be changed. It is going to be something other than the world that we left. And as we're beginning to imagine what we'll find on the other side of this, what we want to create, we have to do a lot of letting go. And I think that actually is a process that we should accelerate and that we should embrace. And I wanna encourage you all to take a cue from uh, the management theorist and futurist Christian Cruz, who wrote an article about five years ago that has stuck in my mind ever since, where he advocated for what he called killing the official future. I think this necessarily needs to be maybe the prime casualty of the coronavirus era. We have to let go of the things that we thought were going to be um, in 2021, 2025, 2030, and Cruz argued that every organization, and indeed I would extend that to every individual, has an idea of what the world will be like, that they're always designing and operating and executing against. That's the official future. That's one that maybe the founders of the company came up with years ago. Maybe you inherited it. And now as a leader, you have to execute on this thing that is no longer responsive to a rapidly evolving context. And now we can see with that context changed more so than ever before and changing more rapidly than ever before, we have to be willing to take these things down off the shelf, poke them, prod them, and make them, to re make them respond to um, new demands. And as we're letting go of these official futures, I wanna encourage you all to push yourself to embrace possible futures, to think expansively in this moment about who and what we want to be, what we want to become, what we want our organizations to become. And because 
Pascal and I, I think both are going to ask you all to engage with us. We want this to be a dialogue and a conversation, a learning exchange rather than just a quote unquote webinar. Uh, I'd love for you to find the chat function in Zoom and just throw out to me some official futures, some ideas that are no longer adaptive, maybe that your organization was working towards, maybe a societal narrative, maybe something for yourself that was the official future that you're going to have to let go or maybe even actively drive out to create room for possible futures. So if there's one that you have, one that pops to mind, I'd love for you to throw that in the chat for me. And I'll be happy to share a few of my own if, if that helps with things as well. Yeah, okay, great. Right, picking up one of those, one of the biggest narratives that we could right there, thinking about uh, how capitalism might evolve, how it might need to evolve, getting away from that zero sum game uh, perhaps to uh, an infinite game. More automation, uh, less boring, dangerous jobs. Tiffany, throwing out my vision of a slow transition away from travel in order to fight climate change. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping, Andrea, that maybe what we're, we're throwing out is some of that, that short-term thinking about the possible future to make room for the long-term. Okay, these are great. Keep these coming, keep these coming. And while you do, Yes, excellent. End of working from boring corporate offices. We're going to talk about that in a minute with uh, Pascal. Um, the thing is this, as we're thinking divergently, as we're imagining all these possible futures, I do want to encourage you to like be wildly imaginative, to give the mind room to roam, to, to embrace that possibility. But I, I also want to make sure that we're, we're grounded and we have some sense of the scope of possible futures and the contours of that post-COVID era, because when it comes down to it, we're not going to be waking up tomorrow in a magical fantasy land. It's not like anything that we could imagine possible will be. We actually can look around today and we can see some indicators of where we're likely to wind up. And I think we should have those in mind as we're thinking of how we build, not just for recovery, but for long-term resilience and relevance. And our thesis is basically this that COVID-driven trends, the things that you can already see starting to take shape, or maybe that were taking shape before this even happened, are going to be accelerating the development and adoption of the infrastructure of the exponential era. And this is both literally, like we can see the internet is going to get stronger because it has to, because so many more people are using it. We can also think of this a little bit more figuratively. Uh, somebody touched on automation a moment ago. We're pretty sure that this is going to accelerate the drive to automation in a lot of industries as people think about how we might want to build something closer to a zero-touch economy. We also believe that this moment is going to exacerbate many of the tensions of what I call our liminal time. And I will go ahead and admit liminal is uh, cultural anthropologist jargon and old habits die hard. Basically, it means that space between one epoch and the next, an old world and a new. And to give you a couple examples of these accelerating trends and these exacerbating tensions, just to kind of seed your thinking, uh, these are all trends that I see accelerating coming out of the COVID era. Movement of services and operations to cloud and then ultimately to fog computing. I think we're going to see, and we already are seeing, increased design of work and learning to be more agile, more distributed. We're seeing the aggregation of personal healthcare data on a scale never imagined before and a lot of impetus behind that. Uh, the deployment of autonomous AI and robotic systems. I think we're gonna see some really interesting tensions around how do we think about automation versus the development of human capital when we come out of this moment as people think about what does it mean to build a resilient system or a resilient human system? And then I think we're also going to see, and we are seeing, the construction of public-private surveillance networks uh, at increased scale and also increased uh, pervasiveness. So these are all trends that were already present, but we feel that they're accelerating. They're going to start to bound that scope of possible futures within which we will be designing our own futures and identifying preferred futures. And then in terms of tensions, a few that I'd like you to keep in mind as well. I think we're going to see the tension that already exists between personal privacy and public safety and security become heightened. And some of the terms of that engagement and debate shift a little bit right now. Someone mentioned capitalism earlier. We're going to see that tension that exists between shareholder capitalism and an idea of shared social value also increase right now. 
I think particularly as we're seeing a huge amount of public investment funding in the form of bailout, bailouts in industries, there's going to be a natural question, a follow on that asks, what do these corporations owe the public? What do they owe the public interest? What can we ask of them if we helped them survive this crisis themselves? How do we redirect them towards a greater sense of social responsibility and social value and maybe begin to revise that social contract? We can also see uh, the development of this tension between global cost efficiency and local resilience as analysts and industry leaders think about reimagining supply chains. And then one of you already identified one of my very favorites is that tension, that polarity that exists between the short term focus and the need for long term vision. And all of these tensions, I think, are going to be heightened, but not necessarily resolved as we work our way through the COVID era into whatever it is that comes next. And as you're thinking about what comes next, I encourage you to have a couple of new questions, perhaps, in mind. Uh, one that we particularly like is how these present signals these trends that we can see accelerating suggest the scope of possible futures, make some more likely than others. I'd also like you to be thinking about uh, what these signals can tell us about building beyond recovery, which I know is that near-term focus, to think about the longer-term vision of resilience and relevance. How do we work towards that? I think right now, we're at kind of a funny moment where there's a natural tendency for a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals as well to sort of narrow their scope, narrow their focus on near-term survival, one foot in front of the other. How do we get through this quarter? How do we get through this year? And I think we do so at the expense of the more expansive longer-term thinking that actually is conducive to longer-term relevance, longer-term survival of the organization and the prospect of creating and realizing a preferred future. We believe that there's going to be a competitive advantage for those organizations that actually can continue to embrace some futures thinking. And with that, I should turn you over to one of my very favorite future thinkers, uh, your dear friend and mine, uh, my partner at Be Radical and longtime colleague at Singularity University, the one and only Pascal Finette. So Pascal, if you want to take over the screen share. Um, I will. Thank you so much. And I want to get right into it and uh, kind of continue where Jeffrey uh, already, the direction Jeffrey already pushed us towards. And uh, I want to start with uh, a quote, um, and that it's not out of Alice in Wonderland, which I still think is one of the best books you can ever read, particularly uh, if you happen to be uh, on some drugs. But uh, more importantly, uh, that quote is probably a quote from someone I would have not expected to ever quote. Um, at least in this context. And it is a quote from Ayn Rand. And Ayn Rand said, uh, you can avoid reality, but you cannot avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. And I think that's actually really, really true. And it has always been true. And particularly, I think it's true today. Um, I also think that uh, it is probably a quote my, uh, my current president here in the United States should uh, probably also consume uh, a little bit more. That being said, uh, if you have ever seen me present, uh, you know that at least for the last, I want to say, three years or so, uh, I have started my presentations with a, uh, uh, a commentary where I tell you that the most important thing I can tell you and the most important thing you need to take out of my sessions is the following, that tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. And I know for a fact that many people looked at this and kind of smiled and said, yeah, whatever. And I kept telling them, when I say tomorrow, I literally mean tomorrow, not like tomorrow in like three years or five years or 10 years. I mean tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, I believe in this new world, um, probably we all can agree uh, on, on this. Just to give you an idea, um, I literally, just before I got on this uh, webinar, saw a tweet come by in, in my Twitter uh, stream uh, where someone just said, Here's two numbers you just need to understand. 23 million unemployed, which is the current unemployment rate in the United States, five weeks. It took five weeks for this uh, really, really weird little virus to do what it did to us. So here's the interesting thing. Um, good friends of ours are the people who run EYQ, which is uh, EY, uh, EY's think tank, and EY, of course, being one of the largest uh, consulting firms in the world, 250,000 employees. 
And EYQ has a framework which I really like. They talk about these three time horizons. They say there's a now, the next, and the beyond. And pre-COVID, the idea was always, you have to have investments in these three time horizons. You need to look at the way you think about your companies, your societies in these three time horizons. I was on the phone with uh, Gil Fora, who runs EYQ, good friend of ours, and he made a really interesting statement just about 10 days ago. He said, what we are now seeing, and I believe he's absolutely 100% right, what we're now seeing is that the now and the next collapses into the same time. We're living in a world where we feel and act in the now and the next right now. And what was beyond, and beyond used to be the five years uh, out there, the beyond is now the time frame beyond COVID-19. So we're talking 2021. So there's a really interesting shift in the way we're thinking about the future. Um, and that leads to an interesting world where uh, if you come to Singularity University, of course, you've seen the goddamn uh, exponential curve a million times. If, you've, uh, if you haven't lived under a rock uh, by now, you've seen exponential curves uh, in uh, conjuncture with uh, uh, pandemics uh, at least a million times. But here's an interesting thing about uh, these exponential curves, and we don't talk all that much at Singularity about this, but there's a reality between a gap between the technolo technological capabilities and our adoption. And what we're seeing here, and this makes me personally really curious and actually really excited, we're seeing something we now call the COVID-19 bump. The COVID-19 bump is basically this, because we are forced into a new reality, because our world has been turned upside down and because these timeframes are shrinking so dramatically, we're now seeing technologies being adopted um, faster and in, in really interesting new and different ways. The very obvious example is the very software you're currently using pre-COVID-19, which only is about eight weeks ago. Uh, the company Zoom had 10 million uh, uh, daily, average daily users, 10 million. As of this morning, they just reported they have now 300 million average daily users, 300 million. Um, that's a, a, a humongous growth. It's like a 30 time growth. And um, the question we're asking ourselves is this. The good news about this world, which kind of feels like we're, we're, everything is turning upside down, everything is changing, a lot of things actually don't change. They might get accelerated, but they're still super relevant and important. So think about topics um, which seem quaint and like not even worth talking about anymore, like the AI disruption, uh, robotics, synthetic biology, which uh, Tiffany Vora is of course a world leading expert in, energy transformation, which you will hear from my dear friend and colleague Ramez Nam about. It feels like, wow, this is like kind of like not the real thing anymore. But I can tell you, all these things are still here. They will still affect our lives in very dramatic ways. And they might accelerate on very dramatic uh, curves. So uh, this is out of a, I believe, a uh, New York Times article. Actually, you need to find the source for this. But we're talking now about a world BC and AC. BC is the world before COVID-19. AC is the world after COVID-19. And here's the interesting thing. We we're seeing these changes happening. And what I'm particularly interested in is when I look at these changes from the world BC to AC, I'm asking you and all our clients and ourselves, of course, which of those changes, which of those things will, in the transition from the world BC to AC, will be gone? So they don't, this is like a, a blimp it's a thing we're doing now, but in the new world, we will probably not do this anymore. Which of those will change and change the way we interact and transact and do our things? And which of those will be completely new, things we haven't done in BC, which we will now do in AC? And of course, everything you need to know, we can summar uh, summarize in a single slide. And I guarantee you have seen that slide a gazillion times. I still want to point something out, which is, if you're standing somewhere here, which in, a, in many, many curves, we're still standing, and you look to the past, the past looks linear and flat. If you have the ability to see the future, the future looks weird, steep, and crazy. Ernest Hemingway wrote a book. In this book, uh, which is called The Sun Also Rises, is a famous quote, which we call the Hemingway Law of Motion. And the quote, quote goes, gradually and then suddenly. 
And gradually and then suddenly is this weird world we're now living in. And I believe we're fortunate to actually have the ability to, for a second, to pause and actually feel it. And my encouragement is, whatever you're feeling now in terms of gradually and then suddenly, take this with you into the future because the future will look very, very interesting and weird. So we're interested in this. We love to spot weak signals. And we've been doing this for the last 20 years, basically. We're really interested in what are these weak signals, the things which we can see already, which are going to change the world forever. And the interesting question for me is we see a million weak signals right now, right? So anything from you're sitting in front of your computer all day long, your kids are at home and not going to school and getting schooled via online video sessions. Um, you're not in an office anymore. You don't commute anymore. You probably get more uh, groceries delivered, all weak signals. And the interesting question, again, I want to put into your heads because I think it's an important question for all of us to answer. And I don't believe anyone has the definitive answer. So you need to make your own sense of this is which of those weak signals will be with us forever, which will be emerging and probably create new things. And which of those will be kind of like staying and shifting the way uh, we live our lives and do our uh, work. So let me give you just one weak signal uh, we are seeing. Of course, we're moving into a world of remote work, right? Everybody knows this. We've been talking about this for like, what, 20 years now? But most companies still don't do it. Now, of course, now they're forced to do it. And here's the interesting thing. So when you look at a world where your work environment looks like this, the question for me becomes, what are the consequences of the consequence? What are the things which will be there for remote work, which will change our world in very dramatic and interesting ways? And you look at things like commercial real estate. I mean, this is an obvious one. Of course, commercial real estate will be depressed because we need less office space. But here's an interesting kind of correlated fact, which a lot of people don't think about. Commercial real estate goes down. And at the same time, and we already see this, I've spoken to uh, real estate brokers around the country. They all confirm the same thing. They all say what we are seeing in residential real estate is that we used to sell small houses and the small houses were on the market and were immediately uh, picked up. Now what we're seeing is we're selling more big houses because people, of course, now in this new reality need more space for their home offices. I mean, think about things like ergonomics, right? Like we settling like shittily, like this gentleman on the, on the couch there, like ergonomics will change. We need to figure out like, how do we do actually ergonomically correct, uh, you know, environments in a home office um, world. Office supplies, you used to get your office supplies shipped in, you know, big truckloads to a centralized office. Now you will probably order your office supplies on the internet and Amazon will deliver them. So all these things will change and they will create interesting ripple effects. And that is where I think the really interesting things happen, where you have the opportunities and the potential um, pitfalls. And then the question becomes, how, how much residue will those uh, weak signals have? How long will they stay with us? Or are they just a blimp in the world because we live in this crazy COVID time? Now, here's an interesting thing. When you look at the daily average, median, sorry, not average, median daily commute time in the United States, so already 24.6 minutes. In the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, the median daily commute time is one hour. Uh, if you happen to work at Google, I used to work at Google, and you live in San Francisco like Jeffrey Rogers does, you're spending an hour each way to get to the Google office. Now, here's an interesting question. If you're one of the Google bots, do you really believe you will get back to wor the, a world where you didn't have two hours of commute and you basically will go back and say, you know what, I could actually do my job from home. Why on earth am I spending two hours sitting in a goddamn bus driving down the peninsula? So I guarantee you remote work will have much residue. It will change, this COVID thing will change the way we think about remote work. And we already see, see it. Zipia, which is a recruiting firm, did a, um, a somewhat representative survey of Americans and they found that 50% of people they surveyed, and granted, they survey uh, what we call white collar jobs. So, you know, like people who do office jobs. But 50% of them said, you know, hell no, I'm not going back to my office. I want to work from home. And then think about what this means for companies, right? Again, enormous change we're happening. 
So what I want to do for you, with you as a last thing for, for now is, if you can go into chat and you can just throw out a couple things, I'm just really curious what you, what you see as shifts, weak signals where we see the COVID-19 bump. Again, remote work is one. Just go and like throw some in the chat and we'll see what we come up with. Um, I can tell you one more, which um, I guarantee you will change the way we, we, we think about shopping, which is um, home delivery. So home delivery is um, the latest data I saw pre-COVID was 38% of Americans have used home delivery. There is no actual data at the moment on uh, what that percentage looks like today, but companies like Amazon are hiring 175,000 people just to keep up with demand. And they have currently stopped allowing home ordering to happen. I guarantee you that of course we will go back to the shops, but home delivery will be with us. So Ishan has click and collect. Um, Tomas, biohacking, fascinating. You should talk about this with, uh, with Tiffany a little bit more. P2P cashless uh, payments from our good friend, Jeffrey Rogers, 100%. You know, one of the things which, is, uh, which Tiffany can tell you at length about is how dirty cash is. There's a gazillion bacteria and, and potentially viruses on this crap. Healthcare is going to change. Telemedicine. I was just on the phone with a doctor um, and a, um, a healthcare provider yesterday who told me how telemedicine has shot up from less than 1% of their customers using it up to 95%. Nearly everyone is doing telemedicine in their world. School education, 100%. Um, so uh, convergence of work and leisure time. Yeah, I mean, who here, like just uh, clearly, like show, like do it for yourself, show of hands, right? Like who here doesn't see the, the, the barriers anymore since you're working from home? Um, political process, yeah, let's see how that changes. Good, uh, uh, really good point here. So tons and tons and tons of stuff is changing. So again, my invitation for you is keep an eye out on those weak signals. We're, we're super excited about what this world after COVID might look like. And, and this goes back to my friend, Jeffrey Rogers, it is on us to create these futures. We have, it is in our world, in our powers to create those futures. This is uh, what I have for you today. Let me just end on a quote. This is uh, Ron Shake, the person you see half of here. Uh, Ron is a dear friend of ours. He's the president and founder of Panera Bread, which is a healthy fast food chain uh, here in the US. He sold the company a little while ago, uh, very, very successfully. And we had dinner and I asked him, how did you do this? And he said to me something which I found so profound that I literally wrote it down on the proverbial napkin. He said, our approach has always been to discover today what will matter tomorrow and then to transform our company into a future that is unfolding before us. I know it is harder than ever to predict the future, but I truly believe that it is on us to really spend time and energy to think about what happens, how will this world look like after COVID-19 and then transform our companies. And I wanna expand this to transform our societies and our communities into that future that we now can clearly see. And I believe this particular community, you all are uniquely positioned um, to do this. Last thing, uh, if you do want to stay in touch with uh, both Jeffrey and I, as well as the larger team at Be Radical, which is the little advisory firm we have built over the years, um, send an email to this email address. We will send you back, uh, first of all, an email with our personal contact details. More importantly, um, we share very openly all our latest research um, uh, on an invite-only network, which we will invite you if you send an email to this uh, email address. The email is a bot. It is a AI which is utterly stupid. You don't need to write anything. You don't need to like put a subject line in there, just a simple email. Um, it will just get back to you. You can be abusive if you want to, if you like wanna like play a little hate on, a, on a, your AI overlords, uh, the bot will not care for now. Um, we'll probably become conscious at one point, so be careful. Um, but by all means, please do, uh, uh, do sign up here. So I wanna um, stop my share now. I'm eternally grateful for the folks over at SU Zurich at this chapter to do what they're doing. Um, it's an amazingly uh, important work and um, you have many more absolutely incredible speakers after me. So Pascal, Jeffrey, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation.
definitely valuable thoughts on the radically different future. I would not say challenges, I would say possibilities. And we do invite you to stay with us until the end of this live, live session. So let's go on uh, with our tight schedule. So uh, our next special guest at this launch event is Dr. Tiffany Vora, Singularity University Vice Chair, Digital Biology and Medicine. Tiffany is an educator, writer, researcher, scientist, and entrepreneur who is excited to bring her diverse experience to the world. She is a speaker and thought leader who uses bio and tech focused mindset to inspire people to design the best possible future. She founded Biana Science, a consulting company dedicated to excellence in science communication. So, without further ado, Dr. Tiffany Vora. Well, good morning from California. I know it's much later where you are all, uh, and I really am so grateful to have the chance to join this wonderful community today. As Jeff and Pascal was just telling us, uh, we are at a really critical moment right now. Um, this is a moment that is shocked the world, not just in terms of health, but also in terms of uh, economy and leadership and a lot of other things. And so while this is a, a terrible crisis that we're facing, we're also in a moment that in many ways is a gift. And it's a, it's a rough gift. Uh, this is tough love, but we have an opportunity here to really be extracting important insights that we can carry forward with us into the future. And that's what I wanna talk with you about today. So as a biologist, um, I spend all day, every day, eyeball full, uh, just completely full of information about COVID, about the virus that causes it, and about all kinds of things that you've been hearing about, antibody testing, virus testing, all kinds of things. I look at curves all day. And I think it's important now for us to take a step back from that flood of information and really start extracting the insights that are gonna carry us forward into the new normal. And Jeff and Pascal, you guys did a wonderful job um, bringing us into that mindset. So thank you so much for that. And I wanna sh share with you all some of the thinking that I've been doing recently around what today looks like, what tomorrow looks like, and the stories that we need to be telling ourselves now as we build the future. Uh, so the first thing that I wanna share with you that this whole uh, pandemic has really exposed to me is the importance of trust. And I've spent uh, the last year thinking about how trust is the single most valuable commodity that an organization can have. But this pandemic is showing me that trust isn't just important to companies if you're trying to sell somebody something. Trust is the foundation of how societies have been responding to this pandemic, how governments have been successful or not so successful at containing the spread of the disease. And trust also has a lot to do with how we're viewing the future. And so one thing that's wonderful about the fact that you're part of this Singularity U Zurich chapter is now you are in a network of smart people who share the same value you do about designing a positive and abundant future. And I think that's really important because now you have a place where you can go when you have questions and when you have ideas that you want your, uh, to get thought partnership around. So for me, uh, as, a, as a biologist and as someone who works in the health field, this trust issue has been really important because honestly, I was very surprised at how quickly the conversation around COVID shifted from medicine and biology and data to fake news at the worst, you know, full on lies to things that are well-intentioned but just aren't true. And when people's lives are at stake, I think that becomes really important. And so what I see is when people are turning to places like WhatsApp or Facebook or TikTok to be getting information, that always surprises me because I go to the WHO, I go to the CDC, and I call my friends who work in these fields and ask them what the hell is going on. And if I see two sets of data that say different things, or I notice that the data aren't reliable, how am I supposed to think about these things? I turn to my trusted sources and my trusted advisors. In this time of crisis, we're seeing just how important trust is. And now you've gained yourself a network of people you can trust and who also know people who potentially are people you can trust as well. 
So I'm really excited about building a future that's really based on trust. Um, so while I'm presenting myself to you as someone you can trust, there are three things that I want to share with you that I think are really important to keep in mind as we're going through this pandemic and this crisis as things are changing. I've been doing a lot of thinking uh, in the last couple of weeks about what we can realistically expect going forward. And um, Jeffrey and Pascal um, were uh, subject to some of my early thinking on this. And I realized from the looks on their faces while I was telling them what I thought was going to happen, that we really need to be focusing on how we're messaging expectations that are realistic, but also hopeful. So there are three mantras that I wanna share with you as we go through not just this session today, but how you watch the future unfold in the coming days and weeks, where we seem to be pulling out of, for the West, our first wave of COVID uh, deaths and sicknesses and trying to figure out what comes next. So here's the first mantra that I want you to repeat to yourself as, of, as often as possible. And the first is, defeating COVID-19 is a marathon, not a sprint. We see lots of information online suggesting that things are going to come quickly, that treatments will come quickly, that vaccines will come quickly, that we can quickly lift regulations, that things will quickly go back to normal. I need to encourage you to embrace a mindset shift in which you understand that the world is not going to return to normal anytime soon, if it ever does. And as Pascal and Jeff were pointing out to you, some of those things that we are changing or giving up or coming up with new versions of, we don't wanna let go. But a lot of those things, I think we should be ready to let go of. Personally, I am thrilled to let go of commutes. I seem to have a lot more time in my day that I can spend with my son. That makes me very happy. So get yourself in that marathon mindset and out of that sprint mindset because we are in it for the long haul here. The second point I wanna point out, your second mantra for the coming time is that you, every single one of us has important things that we have to do for at least a year. 2020 is not going to be the year that COVID-19 ends. I'm not even sure 2021 is. So we are going to need the strength and the resilience and all of these, uh, the, the gratitude and the generosity to keep doing things that are hard over and over, but are really important. Social distancing, when we get our testing, both uh, antibody and immunity testing, we're gonna be need to be doing a lot of testing and it's gonna be a pain in the neck and it's gonna be something your kids aren't gonna wanna do, but it is so, so important that we do these things because they really do make a difference. So when you're asked to stay home, I know it sucks, but resist the urge to cheat because your actions matter. You're an agent of change here and you get to choose to be an agent of positive change. And we're gonna come back to that soon. And the third mantra I want you guys to think about is something that to me really encapsulates the best part of Singularity University as a global ecosystem. And I want your third mantra to be, we are all in this together. This pandemic is showing us that there's no us in them. In my opinion, one of the reasons why this pandemic has felt so different from previous ones, remember this is our seventh pandemic in the last hundred years, isn't because the virus is fundamentally different, it's because humans are connected in ways that we never have been before. And so what happens over there is also happening here. And remember from the virus's point of view, biology does not care about borders, it doesn't care about your politics. It doesn't care about citizens. The virus doesn't discriminate. And so if we can pull together and be better together and take this global species level view of how we're working, I think we're really empowering ourselves not just to take advantage and to, to thrive in these times of crisis, but to set the stage for the new things we're going to have to be facing moving forward. So those are my three uh, mantras that I wanna share with you. A couple of other thoughts. Um, Pascal, thank you for sharing what you shared about the, uh, the C-19 bump. The thinking I've been doing about this has been thinking about how COVID-19 pandemic is actually Trojan horsing the future. So a bunch of things that technological advancements that we care a lot about at Singularity are coming into realization. They're, they're coming into the world with, I would argue, a lot less 
friction than we would have seen six months ago or in the absence of this pandemic. And Pascal, you mentioned a few of them, like remote working and this type of thing. But there are some other opportunities here to um, Trojan horse the future so that we have the opportunity not to take advantage of people's fear of uncertainty, but to really embrace this moment and to let it give us our tailwind. So I actually want to invite you guys to add to the chat some of these things you think we are going to be seeing Trojan horsing into the future. So one example is automation. We hear a lot in the singularity community about how folks are terrified that robots are gonna take their jobs. Well, you know what? A robot can't get COVID-19. So when I'm advising people in the healthcare services, when I'm looking at hospitals, when I'm talking to Department of, departments of health, Department of Health and Human Services in the government, I'm pointing out to them that here we have a moment where automation will save lives. So how can we take advantage of that to shift the conversation to see how things like automation and the AI are superpowers for us and not necessarily in competition for jobs. I went back to this trust idea, needing trusted advisors. Humans are those trusted advisors. So why are we using them for these manual purposes that are um, endangering their lives and potentially endangering other people as well? So I think there's some opportunities for Trojan horsing here. Another one I've been thinking about is universal basic income, right? There's been a lot of resistance to that, especially in places like America, where we have this idea that working is a moral character. But now what we saw through our stimulus package is kind of a UBI being given out to millions and millions of people. And I'm not hearing a lot of complaints. So we have an opportunity here to be Trojan horsing an experiment on UBI, not just in my country, but in many countries as well that are experimenting with different types of aid, a lot of which is straight up cash. So those are two of my Trojan horses, automation and UBI. And please in the chat share if you have some ideas as well where you think this is a moment where folks are relaxing that knee jerk reaction they have to change into the future and might actually be willing to embrace futures that to us seem obviously beneficial, but really challenge other people's conceptions of who they are and what it means to be human. Universal healthcare in the United States. <laughs> Tiffany, do you still people, tell people they don't need to wash their hands? I'm just gonna go ahead and answer that. So the microbiome thing has always been um, my bag. It's my, my specialty. And I always encourage people to have a healthy microbiome and to stop killing the bacteria on their hands. That's under normal circumstances. We are so far away from normal right now. And what this, this disease is showing us is that for this particular virus, just having a healthy immune system is not enough. That's why we're seeing young, healthy people succumbing. So yes, in these days, wash your hands. It's really important. It's one of the most important things you do. 20 seconds, soap and water, it's, it's so, so critical. So please, please keep doing that um, until whatever the new normal is and we know how to deal with that. So these are uh, all ideas that I'm playing with. And, and I wanna go back to something that Pascal and Jeff mentioned, which is this idea of the future and how we're going to be catalyzing the future. So remember what a catalyst is if you're a scientist. A catalyst is something that changes a system without itself being consumed. Your job in this crisis is to not be consumed. So my question to you, to each one of you, and I want us to use the chat to answer this, is how are you going to catalyze the future that you want to live in without yourself being consumed? So let's see, um, what are the things that we can share about that? What are you doing today? What did you do yesterday to make the future a better place? I'm here with you all in my house early in the morning, haven't even finished my coffee yet. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to inspire you all to see that your actions matter and that we have the strength to get through this. So I'm gonna leave the chat open for that. Please share your resolutions on how you'll be a catalyst for change. And remember that quote that um, Pascal shared about uh, how we respond to times of change is a really good one. We are in a crisis right now that is a dress rehearsal for future crises. And there's this wonderful quote that I've heard from a futurist who says, um, when you are facing an uncertain future, there are two ways you can respond. You can put your hands over your ears and say, this isn't happening to me. And you can build giant walls to keep out all the things that are scary. Or 
you can build windmills and harness the winds of change. And what we are doing here as a community, Singularity Zurich, you are building windmills to harness the, the winds of change. And I'm just so proud to be a part of that. And I look forward to supporting you and seeing how you do this together. Thank you. Tiffany, thank you so much. Uh, this was really great speech and so many interesting thoughts and advices, I would say, and even some kind of food for thoughts. And this speech was really impressive. So we have to rush a little bit after these great talks about innovation, education, and digital biology. I'm excited to introduce you Ramez Nam, co-chair for energy and environment at Singularity University. Ramez is a computer scientist, futurist, clean tech angel investor, and award-winning author of five books. He spent 13 years at Microsoft, Microsoft where he led development of Outlook, Internet Explorer, and big search engine. Ramez founded and ran Apex Nanotechnologies, the first company in the world devoted entirely to software tools to accelerate molecular, molecular design. After this very brief introduction, Ramez, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you, Tiffany, for that wonderful talk and those wise words, and, and Jeff and Pascal for your perspectives on this as well. Uh, I'm going to use a slightly different presentation style than uh, the previous speakers and the sort of uh, presentation style, which is shock and awe through numbers. So I'm going to talk about our clean energy future. Uh, as you heard, I'm the co-chair at Singularity for Clean Energy. I actually come from a software background. And these days, in addition to uh, speaking and analyzing clean energy, I invest in clean energy startups. And the reason I do that is from an economic perspective, there's a $6 trillion a year industry uh, being disrupted. But you could say bigger numbers about B2C sectors or social networks or whatever it is. But the real motivator of this is because it is essential to the global grand challenges that uh, Singularity focuses on, whether it is energy itself or climate change or all of the many other sectors like water, food, poverty, the spread of infectious disease, not COVID, but perhaps other ones down the road that are all made worse by the ever warming planet. The scientists have said, basically we need to stay below two degrees Celsius of warming. We've already warmed up about one degree Celsius. There's also a second negative consequence of the way that we use uh, energy today, which is much more visible, which is air pollution. And air pollution, according to the World Health Organization, kills about 7 million people around the world every year. It's a staggering number. We know also, or at least there's a suggestive data, that if you live in a high air pollution area, you're actually somewhat more susceptible to COVID as well. Now, this is an image of Delhi uh, taken about a year ago, and here's Delhi about a week ago. And so one of the things that we've seen with COVID-19 is this uh, enormous reduction in driving. It's enormous, the somewhat smaller, but still significant reduction in power generation that has mostly hit coal. And that has resulted directly in cleaner air that we can see and feel. Sadly, I am not at all confident that it will stay this way. Because while I do think we're ushering in some permanent changes to behavior, uh, for the most part, my suspicion is that when the economy goes back to uh, where uh, it has been, which it will eventually, and when uh, we have good tools in place for dealing with COVID, people are going to go back to their old behaviors with some modification for where they are today, but people are still going to drive, we're still going to move goods around. And so the notion, uh, the way that we've reduced this pollution today by just constraining economic activity isn't going to work. We see already people feel incredibly are uh, restless about and constrained by this reduction of economic activity and are bristling against it. That's not going to be a sustainable way to make decades long uh, changes in the energy system or in the climate system. The good news is we do have a way that is starting to show signs of working and that is replacing the dirty ways that we generate energy with cleaner ways. Now in Switzerland, your electricity is already incredibly clean 
two thirds hydro, one third nuclear. Basically, it's about as uh, low carbon as it can possibly get. But climate change, of course, is a global problem. And so for Europe and for the world as a whole, it's vitally important that we have clean ways of generating energy to meet the world's ever rising energy demand that don't pollute. And so the fantastic news is these are prices of solar and wind onshore and offshore uh, dropping around the world. Uh, in just the last decade. And you see they're falling out of the bottom of the fossil fuel cost range, and that changes uh, everything. Now I could talk at length about wind power or hydro or nuclear, but I'm really gonna focus on solar today because it's the most dramatic uh, in our limited time. In uh, 1977, the cost of a solar panel per watt was $77, now it's 22 cents. That's an enormous, 350 times price decline. That is unlike any other physical infrastructure on planet Earth. And now it means we are starting to get new solar power that is cheaper than building new coal or gas. Around the world, I'll use US uh, currency here, to build a new coal or gas plant will cost you about five or 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And in different parts of the world, in China, the world's largest energy consumer, we're down to 5.6 cents is the feed-in tariff for solar there. But importantly, that's the end result of the last decade of a 5x price decline. If the price declines in China by another factor of two, it's basically unbeatable by fossil fuels. In Germany, people would say, well, you know, Northern Europe, we're not gonna see prices like that. But in the South of Germany, and Germany really is the place where solar started with the energy vendor and that started scaling the industry and started that price decline that we're seeing. Now we've had bids as low as 4.3 Euro cents or about five, uh, U.S. cents. Of course, in sunny places, it's even lower, below four cents in India, uh, at three cents, totally unsubsidized in the U.S. with a 5x price decline in 10 years. There are also in Latin America and the Middle East, we have prices below two cents. And stunningly, uh, it's a country in Europe, Portugal, 1.6 U.S. cents a kilowatt hour. That's less than a third the cost of power from a new coal power plant or a new gas power plant. And this is not just the cheapest bid for solar ever, this is the cheapest contract for electricity ever signed on planet Earth. So basically solar and wind have gone through these two phases. For all of time, until a handful of years ago, they were too expensive, they had to be policy supported, they had to be subsidized or mandated to be deployed. And that's how people still think of clean energy in many places. But suddenly, in just the last handful of years, new solar and new wind have been competitive for new power in sunny and windy parts of the world. And if the current trajectory of dropping in price 30% every time it doubles goes on the solar, then by the time solar goes from about 2% of electricity, which is what it is today, to about 30% of electricity, we'll see global average prices of around one cent a kilowatt hour. Now, not all exponentials last forever. This is a projection to the future, we don't know, but this is the path that it's been going on for decades and it looks very, very promising. So solar prices will keep on plunging. I'll say very briefly that energy storage prices are plunging at a very similar rate. Battery prices have dropped by a factor of 10 since 2010 and now we have uh, projects that with 12 hours of solar and four hours of storage have a lower price than coal. So we're increasing how much energy we can store economically on the grid and storage drops at basically the same rate as solar so it will keep on plunging. And so now uh, we're entering into this disruptive phase. I've told you there were two phases so far of clean energy. First, policy dependent, it had to be subsidized. And then just the last few years, competitive for new power but now we're starting to see hints of a phase where clean energy is sometimes cheaper to build than it is to operate an existing coal or gas power plant. And that's just utter insanity, uh, but it's true. Uh, what started in October of 2018, this utility in Northern Indiana, 65% coal powered, a red state voted for Donald Trump by 19 points, uh, mediocre sun and okay, but not great wind resources, announced in their five-year plan that the cheapest thing they could do is tear down all of that coal, replace with solar storage, wind, and software-controlled demand. We see it in other assessments of energy costs in the U.S., coal costs going up, 
solar costs going down cross over in the early 2020s. I can show you a similar one for Europe, for India, or most importantly for China, where coal costs are rising as plants age and the cost of new solar and wind are coming down. So it looks like basically everywhere on planet Earth, almost, by the end of this decade, building new solar or wind will be cheaper than operating existing coal. And then a similar disruption is going to happen in oil, and it's being driven by electrification, a technology that no one believed in 13 or 14 years ago that is now incredibly mainstream. And it's still more expensive in some sense, but electric vehicles are destined to be cheaper than uh, gasoline or diesel vehicles for very similar reasons. This is the entire engine and drivetrain of an EV. It has uh, hundreds of moving parts less than the engine and drivetrain of, a, of an internal combustion engine vehicle. That means it uses one quarter the energy or one quarter the energy cost per kilometer traveled. That means its maintenance cost is one quarter. And it means that all up, even today, when electric vehicles are more expensive to purchase, they are still cheaper over a four-year basis than uh, gasoline vehicles. And by the end of this decade, they will be something like one half the cost on a per mile basis and maybe 60% of the cost on an upfront purchase price basis. We think that by 2025, 2026, you will be able to buy a new electric vehicle at just plain cheaper than a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle. And that will really be the tipping point in this market. And that will converge with other exponential technologies, with the, the uh, surge in ride sharing and with autonomous self-driving to create uh, what we think will be a self-driving taxi industry that could be a $2 trillion industry. I don't know if you can see this video, but this is a video from Zooks, one of the startups raised about a billion dollars uh, in the self-driving space. And these startups are just getting better and better every day. Really, the leader is uh, Google with their company, Waymo. Waymo now drives uh, more than 11,000 miles on average between times that a human has to take over. And that number has gone up by a factor of six over three years. So these vehicles aren't at human level yet, but they're just getting better and better. And the way they'll be deployed is not that you'll have to buy one of these vehicles, it's that you'll pull out a ride hailing app. This is the Waymo One app, which a few thousand people use today. And the car that comes won't have a driver. Why that model? Because half the cost of a ride share today is an Uber or Lyft. And technology costs will go to zero. And that means it'll be cheaper to take one of these. And that will, uh, through elasticity of demand, we'll see more people switching to this uh, modality because it'll be frankly cheaper than a personal vehicle. And in fact, we think it could go to even half of this cost if you get to small two-seater pods. So this has massive disruptions, disruptions for the, the coal uh, market, disruptions for shipping, uh, a quarter of dry bulk cargoes or coal, disruptions for uh, the automotive industry, $2 trillion industry. What do they do in a world where we access vehicles as a service rather than buy vehicles? Disruption for the auto insurance industry, disruption for even more disruption uh, on top of the current COVID crisis for downtown real estate. But of course, the big one, it's a very positive disruption, is for oil itself. We're seeing today, that you've probably read the news, that the cost of oil went steeply negative two days ago. It's a bit of an artifact, but that was driven by 30 million barrels a day of demand drop. If we look at what EVs are going to do to the oil market, plus some uh, work in electricity, we're looking at closer to 60 million barrels a day of demand at risk of going away and not going away for months or a year or two years, but going away permanently. Now it'll happen more slowly, but this is a major sea shift in actually the, the highest value industry on earth by some measures. So how do you take action in this? Uh, I think it's equally important to advise people in business, government, nonprofit, and what they can do. And so I'll give you just a, a thumbnail of three things I advise. And the first one's extremely technical, so pay close attention. And it is keep calm and, and cover your you know what. <laughs> because, I mean, frankly, we wish we, had, we were doing this uh, as COVID started. But if you have exposure to any of these sectors, well, you're probably in a world of hurt in some of them today, but others like uh, automotive. We might think, oh, the automotive sector is gonna bounce back. 
not the way it was, and not because of COVID, uh, but because we are replacing the kinds of vehicles we've made with very different vehicles. Second, the future, the world is going to spend tens of trillions of dollars on this transition because these technologies, while impressive, are still small. Solar is only 2% of global electricity, wind 6%, EVs are half a percent, edging up on a percent. So the headroom here is enormous and there's plenty of ways to, to think about investing in this and, and you can email me if you're interested or particularly if you're in startups. But most importantly, I wanna say this, keep hope. We still have major challenges. We're still not going fast enough. There are hard to decarbonize sectors I haven't talked about like industry, steel making cement or emissions uh, from raising livestock, but we've done this before. We've turned around the ozone hole. We removed air pollution in Europe and American cities that we had in the 70s. We have the tools to do this if we choose to apply them. So thank you all very much. Uh, you can contact me via my email here as well. And uh, congratulations to Singularity U Zurich for a, a successful launch here, even in the time of COVID. Thank you so much for this illuminating presentation, Ramez. It was really great to learn and I trust your words will impact many future innovations. And here I would like to thank to all of you from Singularity University from Silicon Valley supporting our launch event uh, in Zurich online, of course. And uh, take this note, we will organize very soon the next event in May. So we genuinely invite you to follow us on Zurich chapter social media. So let's go on with our set schedule and our first guest speaker, Mark P. Berneger. Mark is a serial entrepreneur focusing on FinTech, digital assets and exponential technologies. He's on advisory board of Finlib, co-founder of Finance 2.0, board member of Falcon Private Bank, founding board member at Crypto Finance, and he was named Global Technology Pioneer by World Economic Forum. So after this very short introduction, without further ado, Mark Berneger. Yes, hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as you just mentioned, I'm a Singularity alumni. I was there in 2016. And that's why it's a great pleasure for me uh, to see some uh, familiar faces here. Um, I want to uh, uh, give you some additional information about uh, cryptocurrencies. And as we are uh, in uh, the Crypto Valley and Crypto Nation Switzerland, I think. Uh, that's exactly uh, the right uh, place uh, to kick uh, things off. So um, I hope you all see um, the slides, is it correct? So let's kick uh, the whole thing off. I mean, uh, to be a little bit provocative, I just changed the price. Would you really be willing to pay uh, 7,500 Swiss francs for a Bitcoin today? And I think to put everything into perspective, um, it's all relative, right? And uh, from uh, my own experience, being now a tech entrepreneur since more than 20 years, I really remember the times, and I guess most of you also remember these uh, crazy things here, the modems you needed to uh, get into the internet back in the early days. Uh, you also see some of the early uh, home pages of uh, players back then. And I remember a lot of people approaching me, especially after the dot-com bubble bursted, and they really thought that the internet is a temporary phenomenon and it will disappear. And a lot of things we see right now uh, feel very similar, right? I mean, here are some well-respected uh, publications and they yeah, literally thought that uh, the internet is just a a temporary phenomenon and will disappear. And I think we, we are in a very similar situation when it comes to crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, mainly, mainly Bitcoin. Um, when you look at the whole uh, development, I mean, as I mentioned in the beginning, I think just a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to have a, a Zoom call, a video chat as we do it today with roughly 100 people plugging in from all over the world. And we're just at the beginning. You also see these exponential elements when it comes to the 
development and the usage of the internet. I mean, literally everything will be connected in the future. So it goes far further than just uh, using uh, the internet at home or in the office. And that's perhaps uh, as a, a certain uh, indication of the big game changer before the blockchain technology as the underlying technology. We had a this uh, centralized system and now having uh, this new decentralized approach, it makes it far more reliant, far more efficient. And uh, ultimately we have uh, completely different opportunities. People mainly talk about uh, cryptocurrencies, crypto assets when it comes uh, to uh, blockchain technology. But as you see here, there are far more opportunities. I mean, uh, we had some questions from the audience, I think, especially when it comes to uh, governance, uh, governments and politics, online voting, we see a lot of changes in front of us. Um, so it goes far further than just cryptocurrencies. And here, just to put again uh, the whole thing a little bit into perspective, um, when you see the development of the uh, NASDAQ and the Bitcoin price during the times of a bubble, it's uh, very, very similar, right? And um, when you see what happened after the dot com bubble bursted, and as we all know, technology and big tech companies didn't just disappear, um, there was a huge uh, increase of value and that's just a NASDAQ market cap. So we might be at the very similar point when it comes to the um, potential value we see in cryptocurrencies, mainly, mainly Bitcoin. Another uh, chart to put everything a little bit uh, more into perspective is the uh, market cap of uh, certain assets. I mean, we see we literally can't really see the Bitcoin and crypto asset pie. It's a, a little bit, uh, yeah, roughly a tenth of the market cap of a single player like Apple. It's a fraction of a commodity like gold. And what I personally really like, I mean, the global debt uh, pie, as you see, was before COVID. So uh, unfortunately, this pie has become far bigger in the last few days and weeks. But when you look uh, on the right side, the global derivatives market, which is just a uh, 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 in a completely different scale and people always, po always point to Bitcoin as something which is not tangible and there's nothing behind. So uh, it would be interesting to have these discussions when you, when you put it into perspective uh, and look at the global derivatives market. And also something um, I think you should always take into consideration and why do you have a lot of uh, gray hair hedge fund guys now moving into this space. I mean, they saw already very similar developments 20, 30 years ago when they were also a little bit outsider and nobody really thought that you have such a huge market cap of this new evolving asset class. So um, also again, in this case, you see that uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, um, there was also a, a very similar development and nowadays we talk about an industry which is far bigger than everybody ever expected. When you look at the, 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 the state of blockchain, I mean, there's this uh, famous uh, quote that uh, and I think that's happening in every, every uh, vertical that on the short run you underestimate uh, the, uh, you overestimate the effects of technology, but by far underestimate the effect on the long run. And I think that is also a little bit uh, due to the fact that you normally have a uh, bubble and cycles. So at the peak of all these expectations, people are going nuts. And uh, when the bubble bursts, yeah, it's a natural uh, behavior that you move to something else and perhaps forget what's really the underlying substance. Uh, and I think at the, when we look at the blockchain technology, we are now definitely at the phase where you see real use cases and the whole hype uh, cycle is over. So a lot of people are now moving to something else. So you can really focus on real life use cases and really uh, try to solve real problems and not just based on uh, speculative approaches. Then something uh, I definitely should uh, go into detail as well. I mean, uh, I guess most of the participants know that uh, Switzerland is quite famous uh, as a crypto nation, crypto 
valley uh, that's a term which literally evolved in the last few years and i think there's several reasons for that i go a little bit more into detail afterwards but um it's interesting that uh, uh, we have such a tiny country and i mean the most uh, prominent example we read uh, in the press every day is libra right uh, so that uh, this huge project of facebook is, is also based here in switzerland and i think there are a few uh, happenings in the past which made Switzerland to a crypto nation, crypto valley, and well known uh, through all the, over the world. I think one is definitely that some of the first uh, early um, Bitcoin core developers were based uh, here in Switzerland. So there are still a few quite well known and well respected uh, core developers of the Bitcoin uh, community um, which are living here. Then one of the most relevant projects in this space, the Ethereum Foundation, is based here with the Liputerin Lift in Zug quite a long time. So there was real substance and the foundation of a lot of, of things we, we see nowadays, which literally emerged here in Switzerland. Additionally, um, we have not just uh, an interesting ecosystem with uh, the relevant players, investors and entrepreneurs, which is always necessary. I think we also have an ideal regulatory framework. And additionally, Switzerland by nature is decentralized, right? We have direct democracy. We're well known for our political system. So I think uh, without knowing it, uh, a lot of Swiss people, they somehow uh, understand uh, what the idea of a decentralized blockchain-based system is because they literally live it in their daily life and that's why i think uh, we have a far better understanding of the potential of a decentralized world um, as i already mentioned um, we have uh, uh, we were in a tiny country but uh, we bring all the ingredients which are necessary to make this whole uh, revolution happening at least partly here from from Switzerland. And it's also interesting when you look, for example, what happened with uh, Libra, right? Ultimately, the regulatory framework and all the regulators were very open uh, because the same rules apply to everybody, uh, also to a player like Facebook. But ultimately, it was um, uh, the pressure from abroad which made uh, the government uh, doing a step back. So as we all know also in the past that if the pressure from abroad is uh, too big, then uh, as a small country, you have to modify your strategy. But personally, I think we're uh, still in the right, uh, we have the right setup and structure that the project like Libra could become a big success out of uh, the framework in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, just to briefly uh, summarize it, and then I will have a look at uh, some of the questions you might have. Um, so it's more than just a technological, it's also an economic revolution. Um, and the underlying technology blockchain, it has a lot of use cases, but at the moment, I think the biggest one is definitely the whole cryptocurrency space, the internet uh, of value. It's far more than cryptocurrencies. I personally think that uh, the term uh, crypto uh, currency is, is not ideal because uh, it uh, doesn't really include all the other opportunities you have uh, by uh, yeah, having these potential uh, new assets which go far further than just the currency. And then um, I already mentioned that Switzerland is definitely an interesting hub for all these de developments. And personally, I mean, I'm now in the space since eight years, not as a speculator, but as a tech entrepreneur interested in technology and the potential of technologies. I think it's not the question uh, when uh, the whole thing will start. We already see a lot of use cases and as as I already mentioned, uh, we, we have a similar development like in other industries 20 years ago. And I think we will have an exciting uh, near term future. And if you have additional questions, feel free uh, to reach out to me. I think there are no um, specific questions at the moment. So it was a big pleasure to give you some high level insights about uh, cryptocurrencies. And I give over uh, to you, Andrea. Thank you very much.
Andrea, I think you're on mute. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, so much for, for this presentation and for sharing no, this valuable knowledge and information on crypto values. And I hope that we will see you on our events. So let's move on with our second guest speaker, Massimo Gennarelli. Massimo is transformation challenger and organizational designer. He is senior partner and co-founder of futureberry.com. Massimo helps managers and entrepreneurs in omnichannel context to build business models, customer experience, and organizational models that uh, create innovative relations between business and market. Massimo, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, all the people. Uh, it was very nice to stay there because uh, Pascal, uh, Ramez, Tiffany, and uh, the other guests were uh, my teacher during uh, sessions in Singularity University. So I'm very proud to be here like a guest speaker here. So before uh, to start with my talk, I want to spend some few words uh, about Futureberry because uh, what I'm going to say, it's not my just individual words, but the words of the people that uh, coll collaborate with me. So just a few words to understand uh, how Futureberry operates, uh, what we've done, uh, and uh, how we are working with corporate transformations uh, and uh, uh, speculative programs for uh, leaders uh, in the corporation. So uh, I can define uh, Future Barrier like a magical place uh, where people feel good and generate a real impact. A bunch of crazy people, you can say, who basically is a model uh, to be inspired by. Our purpose is that uh, free and constricted minds create a better future. That's why we are all in. Our North Star are the sustainable development goals. That's why we are becoming uh, or we are in the process to be a B Corp. Uh, our, we are a collective of free minds exploring better futures and creating new realities to deliver impact. We mix consulting, parting, art, solidarity, exploration, activism, producing positive impact in people, communities, and the planet. We work with public company, banking, insurance, uh, energy, media. We work with governments and administrations, like for example, the city of Milan, we are, we are based in Milan, of course, and association at university. I want to start uh, with, uh, uh, I think that uh, also Pascal Finet said in his uh, speech, it's about the difference between remote working and smart working. What we are experimenting now in this period is just remote work, remote working. So stay at home and doing your best. <laughs> it's what they say to us. But smart working is completely different because smart working has uh, three different uh, uh, pillars. The first one is agile. So uh, it's important that people work in an agile way. The second one is interfunctional projects. So the people can stay at home, but they have to work in interfunctional ways. And the third ones is that people in the company has to develop new rituals, new rituals that are also uh, linked to the new situation at all. So uh, for me, it's important that uh, on smart working, the, the pact between the corporation and the workers is that there is a trust. There is a real trust and the balancing in freedom and responsibility of people in the firm. So when we talk with uh, corporate transformation, it's really important uh, to understand that we have to go through three critical phases. The first one is a need to change. It's just uh, like the functional phase. Uh, we can say that uh, this is the phase in which people has to adopt digital tools and service design approach. The second one that could be also in the same time with uh, the need to change is will the change, which is the mindset, uh, the mindset step. It's about cultural and leadership transformation process, agile approach in decision and actions. But now, what is asking to the people, and especially to the leader, is act the change. It's about using speculative design, 
passing from the customer experience approach to the collective trust, as Tiffany said before, in corporations and brands. So I can say that during these pandemic days, the decision we are going to take now will have a great impact after the crisis. Nothing will return to its place. So my suggestion is using creative leadership for making decisions and adopting for medium and long term planning and actions a speculative design approach. How in future Barry support leaders in the process of transforming themselves and their cooperation. And we do it by encouraging the adoption of a new leadership mindsetting and acting that we can call creative leadership. The pillars of creative leadership are acting with passion and purpose, applying an explorative mindset, envisioning a better future, orchestrating a creative teams, driving breakthrough change. We can say that creative leadership, it's like a leadership without ego, which is strange, but it's strange, but it's actually this way. And uh, it rests on three pillars. The disagreement, which is uh, making discussion everything the corporation has done till now. The creative dissonance, which is about uh, looking at something completely different what is going now so also in disrupting dogmas with markets with clients with our organization and the third one is mutual learning which is really important having the people be connected in the firms creating discussion having interfactional groups the second uh, step is by thinking and exploring and encourage speculative design. That is an attempt to create stories of possible future realities to question the implication in the present. It deals with uh, rethinking the role of technology in daily life by addressing not so much its applications, but rather than its implications. As Pascal Finet said before, he made uh, wonderful examples about uh, the difference uh, in uh, what is going on, uh, looking at uh, the implications of remote working. And he's done a lot of examples, really funny, but really good, about what is uh, important in doing a speculative uh, approach. Uh, so how we can work uh, in a speculative uh, approach design? So, the most important thing is reflecting and questioning, having a macro perspective to rethink the sense and the use of design itself, and design at the service of social and political phenomena. So not just looking at our belly in corporation, but looking at consequence for the social and for the environment itself. This is really important, really important because uh, the way in which the corporation are transforming themselves is also important, not only for the people that works in the corporations, but for all the stakeholders, which are more important than we can understand before from strategic management. So, uh, we are arriving to the third step, which is by making the, to the leaders uh, the leap towards the speculative leadership. Today's leader that wants to make sure that its organization remains relevant to today's strong changes cannot ignore this philosophy, acting not as a reaction, but as an anticipation. This is really important, really important and crucial for them. The speculative leader collects the skill of the creative leader and the philosophical structure of speculative design facilitating collaborators in exploration, in exploration and spreading a speculative and positive approach on the impact and present and future implications of the actions. He's able to move away from the constraints of markets, to imagine scenarios, products, services that put citizens, not customers, citizens, the environment at the center and that generate a virtuous circle for the organization and for society. 
So the three assets of this leadership is profit, people, and planet. We can say that the final result of this growing leadership is a leader with a strong sense of responsibility regarding the effects that his or her guide brings to the work of the company and who caves about the social implications of the output produced, whether it's a prototype, a service, or the use of technology. Let me say that uh, some days ago, a great man says these words, nobody will save by, the, by himself. You remember probably it was in Rome and it was in uh, St. Peter place. From a corporate point of view, this means that now the imperative for transformation is taking care of people and planet to grow the profit in a sustainable way. We must stop thinking in terms of CSR and foundations, but think that the collective good is the true measure of the well-being that we create. Just an example for my culture. In my country at the moment, the 30% of students are not able to follow the programs for their education because they don't have internet at all. They don't have an iPad, they don't have a PC, they don't have a mobile or smartphone. So it's a pity because we don't have in our country the social status elevator that all the people need. So from a public and from a private sector, I think that uh, working with uh, creative leadership in mind and uh, a speculative leadership in mind is join their forces and try to, find, to make uh, the internet at home like the bottle of water at home. So just, uh, I want to give you my last uh, thought on this period. They say that this is a war, but it is not a war. Because wars are fought with the aim of defending and preserving one's lifestyle. The emergency asks us, however, not only to plan substantial changes, but to entirely discuss our hierarchy of values and our way of thinking. The earlier we start, the better. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Massimo. Really many thanks. And we are quite confident that companies you work with will have a bright future. Now we have to move on uh, with our special guest from Singularity University, Carl Hermans, SU Exponential Change Activation. Carl is co-founder and chief executive officer of Be Courageous the first, the digital first global business consultancy that builds a global community of purpose-driven, high-performance leaders and create in exponential impact in the areas of leadership, culture, strategy, innovation, and technology. Kyle, Kyle guides leaders and their organizations to high-performance and transformative breakthroughs through activating their mindsets, energy, and action. Without further ado, Kyle, the stage is yours. Thank you so very much. Uh, this has been such an exciting and amazing uh, group of speakers and presentations, and it's uh, fantastic to see such a lively and interactive audience as well. And thank you so much to SU Zurich, and congratulations uh, for your launch as well. I'm very, very excited to be able to speak with you today. I know we've got compressed time. I'd like to be talking with you, building on all of these amazing speakers today, is building on courageous leadership. So you've heard some really powerful ways to reframe your mind, to push your energy, to look for really great opportunities in the market, getting some really strong knowledge about where disruption is coming from, opportunities that you can take. What's super important here is for you to be able to lead courageously into that future. So this is about accelerating change for growth. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to share with you over here is um, a little bit about myself real quick. 
my name is Kyle. I run a consultancy called Be Courageous, and a big mission and purpose for us is about helping people break through impossibilities and doing that together. So just know that from the context of what I'm speaking to you today, that is my intention. Now, one of the very big things here, as you've heard throughout the day, is that for us, we study and have been studying for many, many years the concept of courage. Now, what takes place when you're leaning into and activating the courage that is inside of you, especially when you're facing such prolific times like we are right now. There are two things that we can do. We can either pause and wait things to change around us, or we can dig inside and activate and lead into possibilities where we can start showing up as role models, taking charge and really leading into our courage. Now, the big thing here is that a lot of the time when we see the unknown, as you've heard today, that can be quite scary. That can be quite um, overwhelming. Now, for us, courage is not the absence of fear. It doesn't mean that fear doesn't exist. It means that there's something more important than the thing that you're fearing. Something's on the other side of what you're fearing that is more important and that is driving you forward. So I want to share something with you, and I'm going to give you a little, just a few quick frameworks in the time we have to leave you with some intentionality and some actions that you can take. One very big thing here is if you wanna activate courage inside, at the center of this that you would see over here is that everything that we're generally striving for, no matter if we are in a comfortable position or we are dreaming about a future possibility, is that we are looking for meaning and a sense of meaning and a sense of freedom. We want freedom in our life, we want that comfort in our life, we want to have our stresses reduced from us. Now we're in a very high stressful situation where we are all equal level facing a massive unknown while taking care of our health, while taking care of a new type of environment. There are three really important things here that I would like for you as courageous leaders on this call is to be very mindful of. The first thing over here is around starting to develop and activate and really double down on your interpersonal skills. Usually in a time of crisis and stress, we are become way more introverted. We start to reduce inside. We're going in because we're trying to think about how do we get out the situation? How do we create something new? One of the most important things when you are leading into a future courageously is the level to dial up our ability to relate to others and relate to our environment, even if it's unknown. So one of the skills to double down on here are your people skills, which is how do you start to think about what do you want to relate to with others? How do you want to relate to others? How do you want to relate to this environment? And you heard here from Tiffany earlier as well, which is building community, reaching out, checking in, speaking with other people is super, super vital and really important. The second here is how are you handling and managing your own body, your own environment, your own family, your own team at the same time? The mind-body activation is super, super important. If you're looking to lead courageously, you have to be able to manage and collaborate and dial up your energy inside. What that means is how are you thinking right now? And you heard from the other speakers, there's a piece about pivoting and shifting your mindset to look for optimism, look for opportunity. You heard from Ramirez you know, that there's also, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yes, there's some big statistic numbers, but there's opportunity. Our mind has to reach that and our body has to be energetically ready. We've got to you know, calibrate our sleep. We have to calibrate our health. We have to calibrate our nutrition to really stay focused on this. Because when you're going for the long game that you heard today and you're really trying to drive forward, we have to, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that enjoys Ironman. I know that if I want to achieve a very long distance goal, I have to conserve and really maintain my energy. As Tiffany said, not just a short sprint, we're in for a long game. We have to force a really strong connection between our mind and body. Now, the other thing here is your achievement strategies is this ability for you to go after what is it that you want to create? What is it that you want to go after? What is it that you want to achieve? Now, it may be that your pipeline or your current situation or the 2020 that you visualize at the end of 2019 may be completely different happening right now. It doesn't mean stop. What it means is you actually have the opportunity to refresh, recalibrate, and set your goals and intentions. So this over here in terms of your courageous outcomes, three really big areas I want you to double down on are 
how you're starting to relate to yourself and others around you, how you're activating your mind and body and keeping yourself energetically ready for this journey that you're on. And the other is, what are you striving towards? What is that achievement that you're striving towards? So I'm going to give you a couple of things here, six quick tips of a framework that you can build up with. And what I've done for you at the end of this, there's a link that um, I will share with you guys that you can go to where you can download some of these templates as well for you to be able to work on. And there's some extra bonuses in there for you too. Um, I'm going to start with number two. Number one is the most important, but I find that number two is a really great place to start. There's a thing here that as you're developing up, one of the first things that you've got to look at in activating those three areas is what do you need right now at your core? going back to your basics, going back to your fundamentals, recalibrating. These could be things like waking up and getting your schedule right, getting your structure, getting your agenda right, knowing that you have to skill up some, in some basics. What are the core things that you need right now to lean into what Pascal and Jeff and Tiffany and, and Ramiz and all the other speakers spoke about? What do you need at your baseline, at your fundamentals to be able to lead with courage into this unknown? Is it more rest? Is it you know more help around you? Is it skilling up? Is it restructuring your, your agenda? Is it just going back to the basics? What is that that you need at your core? This is very, very important because your core is your baseline. Think of it as the foundation of a house that if you're going to be building for a new future and you're stacking going after great change or pivoting really quickly, as many businesses are, they're looking for themselves in this new future. What can you rest on? What are the things that are your strength and your foundation? What are the values you're living by? What are those core attributes you're living by? Because when things get a little disruptive, and as Tiffany said, this may last a lot longer, we want to be able to rest back on something that gives us vitality, meaning, and, and, and connection at our core. The second, sorry, the, sorry, not the second one. The third one over here is about looking for short-term and medium-term challenges that allow you to start activating on your core. There's big changes happening. Big change can be scary. How do you break those down into bite-sized things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that allow you to drive yourself forward? This is activating. Every day, figure out one way that you can start to activate yourself. Is there an email you can send? Is there a conversation you can have? You heard from Pascal. He's on the phone with a lot of different people right now, learning, studying, connecting. How can you activate? What is the short-term thing that you can do day by day that is helping you progress and ease into this new unknown and into this disruption that starts to build your confidence, that starts to build your courage, and that gives you a way to practice what you've identified is at your core that you need to be able to establish and grow on. The next one over here is once you start working on those day-to-day -day things, you also want to have those stretch goals. You also want to look for growth opportunities. Right now, you know, if I take an example from our own business, we did most of like 90% of our work are in-person sessions, traveling around the world, much like the other speakers here from Singularity, are uh, doing long-term programs, multiple days, different geographies. When all of that went away, one of the big growth skills that we had to figure out was to pivot to being a digital first experience. Luckily, we kind of figured a little bit of that out last year when we had some other big dramatic things happen in the state of California that kind of cut out and disrupted some of our workflow. So we were getting ahead on digitizing ourselves. But one of the things that we had to learn there was what is the growth goal who could I be? How could I actually impact more people by shifting and giving myself something to aspire to? One of the things that we found just by, by minimizing the amount of physical locations we went to, but being able to be here now, I could imagine with the you know, 90 plus people that are on this call, um, with all of us from different locations around the world, how amazing is this that we can come together and inspire each other and learn from each other and just think about the ripple effect of impact a year ago, that was very different. Intact teams come into an intact room in an intact space. This for me was a stretch goal. This for me was a massive growth goal. Where are there opportunities for you to start driving your personal growth, pushing you and yourself to the next level where you can take responsibility for this, lean in courageously to the disruptions and the opportunities that are in front of you. The fifth one over here is about building bridges. As you're strengthening core, as you're learning in those short-term activations, as you're going for your stretch goals, you have knowledge. 
One of the biggest things that we need to overcome anything right now is to build bridges and connectivity with each other, just like we're doing here. So congratulations again to Singularity Zurich. You are starting to create that. You are building bridges. You're building networks, you know, with the rest of us on the call, as well as our responsibility to start role modeling that. What advantage knowledge do you have that you could help somebody else level up? Because right now we are trading and negotiating and sharing different types of resources than just transactional resources. We're sharing knowledge. We're helping people understand. We're helping get breakthrough. We're, we're wanting to get this world back on track. We're wanting to be able to heal. We want to lean into a new normal and create what that is. But some of us have, have strategic and really good knowledge and, and advantage knowledge in certain areas and others don't. So as much as we can provide knowledge to others, they could provide it to us. So building bridges, being that bridge builder is so fundamentally important now. The sixth one when you do this is about community. Must have community on your mind. Who are your ideal community? What are the minds that you want to surround yourself with right now? Is it more negative input? Is it more negative people that are bringing the energy down, that are not trying new things? that are, are just caught up in a spiral of fear? Or is it a community of people who are aspirationally trying to push themselves to the next level, trying to get something new built and created, who are testing, who are learning, who are collaborating, bridging knowledge. That community is so important. And I challenge you to think of yourself as going out into the world as a role model, a role model for change, a role model for prosperity, a role model for hope, a role model to say that there are other ways to do things. And so the biggest thing here, the number one thing that we found that really drives all of this with courageous leadership and it really activates your core, your, 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 your strength in your core, those short-term wins, that growth, building bridges, and inspiring a community is your purpose, which is why are you doing this? What is the future you want to live into? Where are you trying to grow to? What is the thing that brings you vitality, joy, meaning, and energy? When you're driving forward as a courageous leader, one of the most important things here is for you to be able to bring that energy, but you have to have a fundamental connection to doing things that you love. If we're only going after things that we don't love, or we're not going to follow through with most of the things that are here on this page. What we have to be able to do is do it with joy, do it with passion, do it with vitality, because when you do that, you will face any, any kind of courageous outcome. And I want to share with you guys on, on this call, myself and my wife, we actually have had COVID. So um, earlier in the year, um, I had quite a bad bout of it. My wife has had a less bad bout of it. And I can tell you coming out on the other side of it, it is, yes, it's, it's very rough. It messes up the body, but it's not one of those things that will stop you in the tracks and, and end your situation. There is a way that you can deal with it. And on the other side of it, once you've got that immunity to it, and I'm living a testament to that, and so is my wife, is that you can still drive forward once you've got it. It is, it is a scary concept, but it is not as scary as, as we think it might be. Now, some people obviously have not had a great outcome with it. Others have had a very mild outcome with it. We had a couple of spectrums of it, but I can tell you right now that having gone through it, I'm more motivated on the other side of it to help, to share, to build these bridges, to, to demystify the situation and lead forward. And what it requires us to do is be role models and show up as a community and courageous leaders and to activate on all the things that you've heard here today. So I want to leave you with this, which is that in our world, in my world, I believe that being courageous, stepping in and leading in and doing the hard stuff, doing the hard work, really facing those fears is one of the most uncrowded places on the planet. We will deviate to fear. We will listen to the opinions that kind of keep us a little suppressed or second guessing far quicker than we will lead into the hard stuff. I invite you that on the other side of the things that you might be fearing or that you're worried about is actually your liberation, your joy and your freedom. So I highly, highly, highly recommend to be, um, you know, to lean in and be, be super, super courageous with this. And what I'd love to be able to do here is take some questions or also lean in here and just say, is there anything that's that, what are you going to do from a perspective in strengthening your core, going for growth goals, going for aspirations, you know, setting up your community. I'd love to hear from you. But thank you so, so very much for being able to speak with you today. And I'll see if there are any um, 
any things over here that you're saying. Um, yes, and please, for those of you that would, um, yes, it's it's true. There are many, many human beings that are passing away from COVID, and it's and it's a very rough thing. If anybody wants to speak to me about what happened for myself, I'd be happy to talk about it. It was not pretty eight to 10 weeks of crazy, um, but there is a way to get through that. And I know Tiffany will have great tools and techniques as well about your health and vitality. But if you want to connect with me, uh, please connect on LinkedIn. Here is that information. And for those of you, um, there will be a link that's going to be coming up. Singularity uh, Zurich will send it out uh, probably after this call. I will have created a, a special link for you that has a couple other techniques and activations for you to play with and some frameworks to download and some videos to watch specifically for you. So thank you very much for your time. Please stay safe and, and go forward and be very healthy. Wow, Kyle, thank you so much. So powerful message and motivation from your side. And I have to say that I'm thrilled with impact of today's presentation and speeches, and I trust you feel the same. And now this, we come to the end of this uh, session and I would call, I would say launch event of uh, Singularity University Zurich chapter. And I would like to say thank you and goodbye from my side. And now I will give the mic and the spotlight to Alessandro, Biagio and Diego. And guys, the stage is yours to finish this amazing, amazing launch event. And once again, thank you to all speakers and guests uh, on our launch event. Bye. Thanks, 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 Andrea. Just, just a point that I want to, to leverage and um, just lead our community to reflect is first of all, thanking our speaker and just advise that all our speaker decided to put uh, their time free of charge uh, here for us to provide food for our thoughts, talking about technologies, future of the work, future of the humanity, how to react to this situation. And that's fundamental uh, in the sense of fostering our, our community to tackle global challenges, as this is the first sign of generosity. And this is the kind of generosity that we would like to engage and move forward uh, with you. So again, thank you all, uh, Ramiz, Kyle, uh, Pascal, Jeffrey, uh, Massimo, Mark, and, uh, and, and Ramiz again. Really, we really appreciated uh, your, the time that you decided to dedicate to us. Um, just a couple of, of messages. We have another event on my 28th. Uh, this will be again live, as unfortunately we cannot meet face to face. Um, I want just to give you some, I don't give you some detail. I just tell you that to, this would be groundbreaking, really. Uh, we have international speaker and this will be about artificial intelligence and the future of education. Uh, moreover, as we can't actually, uh, because of the coronavirus, meet face to face, our future uh, offer to the community will enrich in digital way, proposing not only the webinars, the kind of event that you've seen today, but proposing paneling, uh, panel interviews when you can interact, think tank and uh, ask and give session. And this is still at the core of our mission. So provide you food, for thoughts, uh, uh, connecting you and engaging meaningful conversation. So before wrapping up, I just um, ask you 30 seconds of your time to ask for our pool and uh, this will take no more than 30 seconds and then I'll leave the word to Diego and Biagio for wrapping up. Thanks for that, much appreciated. And uh, it seems that the majority of the companies, the multinational and the organization are um, partially ready uh, for the future upcoming changes and, um, for, and the majority of the rest is uh, actively working on it. Well done, but don't forget you are a midway. We can continue and helping each other on that way. 
So let me let me launch the next and last pool. This will be even even shorter. Give me just a second. Okay. Sorry. I need to switch to that one. And that's for you all. If uh, as today we were pretty pretty short. Um, if you would like to know more about our speaker, their engagement uh, with Singularity University and what they do with and without Singularity University, that's your chance to, to hear your voice. And uh, here we go. So <laughs> lucky that I'm, I'm seeing your eyes where, while we are getting. And uh, wow, <laughs> I have to be honest, I didn't expect it. Uh, a share so high, so good to know, really appreciate it. And uh, we, know, we know what to do for the upcoming events. Saying that, thanks again. And uh, I will leave the last words to Biagio Diego. So I take up the, the word. I would like to thank you everyone, our audience, our speakers. And uh, I would like to launch a uh, last message. Since we are community and we were talking about, um, Tiffany was talking about trust and uh, we are globally interconnected. So we think that uh, contribution, uh, knowledge sharing is something we have to value. Um, therefore, we are open, of course, to any contribution you might have or, who, or for people who wants to join us. And uh, we are happy to, um, to talk with everyone so that our community can grow and uh, first of all, we can share our knowledge. That is, I think, the main aim we have. And the uh, last, uh, last thing to hand over to Biagio. And I hope to see you all once more in our next event. Keep it tuned. Thank you, Diego. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Pascal, Jeffrey, everyone. I just, uh, I just really enjoyed uh, all the time. And uh, uh, thanks for being with us. Um, actually. I, I really feel like proud of this team, of this uh, all four of us, which we have been um, been able to make it happen, even if uh, we are not really face to face. We are quite strong in face to face uh, uh, meetings, but uh, now we have to learn this new world. We have to learn how to be effective in a, in a digital world. We have to learn how to deliver a message in a way which is completely new to all of us, to uh, most of us. So uh, the, the aim of this community of Singularity Chapter Zurich, it's community, it's the real sense of the word. It means that we have to get together, we have to meet each other, we have to contribute to each other, and we will enjoy. What is most important is in this moment to enjoy the time we spend together. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope to see you soon, even virtually, but I will be very happy to see you soon again. Thank you so much and have a great day. Let's have a beer somehow. Thank you so much, my guys. We wish you all a lovely day for the people connected from the States and a lovely evening for the people connected from, from Europe. Take care.